talking about Anthony Calvert. Down in front. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Maybe they're supposed to be here. Let's do a mic check. Maybe use a mic megaphone. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. check. How about a megaphone? So when we talk about anti capitalism, so when we, we talk, talk about anti capitalism, we also have a particular way of looking at the world. We also have a particular way of looking at the world and analyzing it. And analyzing it. Now, one of the definitive, or, one of the definitive, or most important, is Marxism. Is Marxism. And particularly, and particularly dialectic materialism. Dialectical materialism. Or in deterministic argument. So A equals B. A equals B. You don't need a mic second. A equals B. B equals C, and therefore A equals C. Right? Or A leads to B, and B leads to C, and so on and so forth. So when we're talking about dialectic, it comes from the word dialogue, and it's like an interaction. And I'm sure lots of people have a lot to comment on. You have a If I'm simplifying things, I'm sorry. Correct, right? Yeah, so what you have is a process of relationships that are in contradiction and that are organically and dynamically uh, going through a process together. And it comes from this idea of dialectics of ideas, right? Of history is made up of ideologies, and these ideologies um, are in constant contrast and come up with a, a synthesis which leads to more contrast. Now, the way Marx lined it up was he looked at our means and processes of production, our labor, and that which gives value to, brought to products, to commodities. And so our labor, our means of production, are in interaction, affect and are affected by our technology, affect and are affected by the reproduction of daily life and commodities, so hammers and linen and coats, affect and, are, and, and they all affect and are affected by our social relations and how we relate to one another as, as men and women and races and classes and sexes and so on, our mental conceptions and our technology. So, for example, Without the telescope, we wouldn't have a mental concept of the Earth being rotating around the sun, as opposed to the center of the universe. Um, so, like an example of that coming out of this corner of this setup, right, is a commodity, a given commodity like a hammer. A hammer has a certain has two contradictory values. It has one value that is abstractly made up of the work that is put into it, making it. But it's got two contradictory values, a use and exchange. Do I keep my hammer to smash things with, or do I exchange it for something else? That internal opposition expresses itself, itself in our political economy through an external opposition, which isn't, which isn't use and exchange, but commodity and money. Um, Barry, maybe you can go into okay. more. What are you, okay, one of these simple ways of explaining dialect the dialectic, there's nothing that stays the same, everything has its internal contradictions. You look at ice, it turns, the power is made when there's different circumstances, its internal circumstances make the changes of water. Likewise steam, that was one way, but with society, the same way. Throughout the human prehistory, there used to be sharing, everyone shared and half starved. When it became enough around to distribute and have more than enough, those that had more than enough took it on to themselves, and those people in turn took on slaves. The slavery society in turn led to rebellion. History of Rome, and because of chaos, they decided to make little isolated kingdoms. Those little isolated kingdoms need to make things. And they became a need for commerce. Those people that made things and traded things became the capital. That is something that is uni almost universally acknowledged. 
the thing that is most unique contribution is that in order to make things, one needs labor to do it, and those who work, work for labor have absolutely nothing to gain by making other people rich, and turn will rebel and make a different society called social. And once the social people cooperate for X number of years, generation and communism, which is not the other thing about dialectical materialism is the word materialism. When we think of the word materialism, we think of greed and getting all kinds of goods. The philosophers, including Marx, use it as different things as ideas versus matter. And that matter is the way you judge things, not by what people you think of things. For instance, whether or not a society is capitalist depends upon whether people own everything in common, whether there is internationalism, which people did, such as sending 30,000 doctors abroad without getting compensation. Likewise, as to whether or not the dictatorship, you say how many people are in unions determining their work conditions. 7% in the United States, or 12% if you count government, is contrasted to 97%. So we can speak about hierarchy all we want as an idea, but we say how many people are in organizations becomes a material way of answering the question rather than saying, do we like it or don't we like it? Likewise, as far as women's condition, there are 3.8 million women in the Federation of Cuban Women. That's a country about 11 million, a little bit bigger than Los Angeles. When you have that many people organized, you're not going to be able to get around away with having food try to blockade abortion clinics. Abortion is free and legal in Cuba. And half of the doctors and technicians are causing. So that's what you mean by materialism means to go by what is rather than what you think. So in other words, what, what we're trying to get across is that Marxism or dialect materialism is a, is, is a method of analysis of history. And it's actually the basis of sociology. Um, Marx, or a few sociology. others, are the fathers of sociology, and, and, and yeah, I'm sure there's, there's women involved as well. Um, yeah, like Hannah Arendt. Yeah, and, and so, like, <laughs> when we say, when people, you know, say they're anti capitalist, uh, apply these methods and these arguments, uh, this is kind of what we're, we're getting at. Or when people mention that things are in dialectic, or when we, you know, that's. That's what it is. I, I don't know. It's kind of a complex thing. I don't fully understand it. I don't know if anybody really does. Maybe we can open this up for. Yeah, we got a college So, one, two, three, four. So, applying dialectical materialism to the current time, I would say that the way the capitalists kept workers from rising up was they exploited the third world. They took all the resources by force and they killed people and they used racism to justify that. Because they were real people, they weren't white, they weren't European, and therefore they were able to maintain a standard of living and call it, quote, democracy, when in fact the bottom line was always the profits of the few in direct contradiction to the many. So the dialectic change in terms of what was primary of those opposites when they could no longer afford to do that as imperialism, which is the last form of uh, capitalism, when there aren't enough markets and they're competing for war, and that's why we're going to war all over the place, because we have a war on politics, can no longer cover up the truth. And people are struggling more, and they're poorer now, and they, they're seeing the 99 percent. So I think now is a very important time. You're here. I've seen um, the study of dialectical materialism as a study, scientific study of change, of how things change, and it's been my understanding that that what we saw happen when when he mentioned that we need to go through socialism 
that 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 change never led that that wasn't a qualitative change and never reached communism. So I think what what we need now is instead of going to this middle state middle state that we would need to do something further and go like straight to communism rather than trying to do some some in between state. Um, and I think that that the the primary contradiction has to end up being between the workers and the bosses. Right now they're kind of in between between the the bosses, right? The imperialist bosses and wars and stuff. But to to ignite a revolution, we're going to have to have the the workers and the bosses be that primary contradiction going on in the world. And I think that's where this movement comes into play and and parties that are organizing towards the revolution so that we could. Um, intensify that contradiction and, and create a part of change. Number three. Okay, if I go on a little long, it's because I'm a nut. So just tell me to shut up, okay? <laughs> well, what I see happening, which is different from what's been described, is Marx was always... He was, he was claiming that the means and processes of production move faster than the social relations. And so the social relations are always trying to catch up. So right now, what I see happening is that we have means and processes of producing information and ideas and circulating them through the internet without bosses that then creates a, a contradiction in these social relations where the bosses say to themselves, Oh shit, information is currency, information is money, information is expensive to produce. And these people are circulating it freely, widely, and then taking those, infra those pieces of information and using it to get in touch with one another. I've been thinking about it a lot lately, especially in, in how we all formed as a community. We didn't come together because we were all part of a, a particular union or a particular um, uh, organizational structure. We came together because we found each other through the internet. We found each other through keywords through Occupy Wall Street, through Google, through chat rooms. And so I think there's a big contradiction between the social relations and the fact that we have actually seized a pretty big part of the means of production right now. One of the things that I just want to call attention to, but if you want me to shut up, I will, um, is just what's really important about use versus exchange value is how we turn use value into exchange value. For instance, if I have a surfboard, I'm a fat motherfucker. I'm not going out on the beach on a surfboard. It actually has no use value to me, right? But one of you might have a use for a surfboard. So we come together and we say, well, maybe what is it that you have that I might need that we can exchange for the surfboard? So let me say, what I really want is an iPod. So how many iPods would you give me for my surfboard. Say a number, anyone? One. One. One iPod? Two? What's an iPod? Depends on the surfboard. Depends on the surfboard, right? Depends on how many gigs are in the iPod. And this is happening because we're all performing a little bit of magic. We're all reducing the, those items to money. And because we can reduce everything to money, that's where we get this kind of contradiction between the use value and the exchange value. Because if I have something that is literally worthless to me, I will hold on to it until I find something that you have that I can make useful. And Marx saw a really big problem in, with this because people would hold on to things that they didn't necessarily need and they would, you know, build lots and lots of structures around those things like all of these buildings and, and to make sure that no one could seize those things back. And so with that, I check. But if you're interested, I'll talk more later. Okay. So my name is Barbara, and I wanted to say something about also that new value and exchange value real quick, which is the way capitalism works. I could be really hungry, and there's a store that has bread in it. I'm really hungry, and I go in the store, and I say, I need the bread. And they say, okay, pay me. And I say, I don't have any money, but I need the bread. And they say, you can't have the bread. And the next day, if nobody bought that bread, the guy is going to throw it in the dumpster and put bleach in the dumpster so no homeless person can take the bread rather than let somebody who needs it have the bread. 
so there's use value and exchange value, and they're in contradiction, but in capitalism, exchange value dominates. It doesn't matter how much I need to use the bread, if I can't pay for it, I can't have it. And the thing is, we don't need socialism, we don't need any society with money. We need a society where the majority of people in the world, which is us and the working class of the world, reduces all the use values that we can, because workers produce everything, and we don't have money. We just use it. We produce for human need, and that's real communism, and that's what we need. And that's what the International Communist Workers' Party, which I'm proud to be a member of, is fighting for. And really, we need a society with no exchange value at all, only use value for human need. Capitalism can't do that. Okay. Um, the dialectical part, I mean, I, I think it's all complicated. There's lots of stuff in there. The dialectic kind of like, the, there's lots of like, what is it? You like know, talk, um, things that, that people say, like, you know, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. These contradictions, like, they're, they're common, and it's not like contradictions, aren't they interesting? Let's talk about them. But what Marx is really getting into was that. It's these contradictions that are all around us, and working through those contradictions is the progress of society. So it's like through those contradictions, you get the change and the vitalization. And so capitalism is just like a machine for making contradictions and pushing through them. So he talks about the revolutionary parts of capitalism and that you're constantly changing the way things are made, the, the, the way the workplace is organized, all of that constantly changing. Um, I think the other part I wanted to get into is so with the, the exchange value and commodities, uh, an important part was also alienation. And so the, the, the transition of society from making things that, that people are going to use or, you know, you know, exchanging, you're going to make a shoe, use a shoe, enjoy the shoe. But now you're, you're making, you know, sprockets that go off into some other thing and, you know, it's like you can't even figure out where it's going to be used or how it's going to be used. You're totally alienated from your production. So you're no longer making for enjoyment, you know, this tangible social relation between people, you're making for a box that is, you know, how you've been separated, alienated from your labor, you're alienated from your coworkers, you're alienated from your neighbors, your family, that alienation, how that drives so many problems in society and that development and how so much of that can be traced back to, you know, the, the structure of the economy in the workplace and, and the driving force of profit and not humanity as a central goal. Thank you. Uh, Jack, <coughs> we are closing Stack now. So if you're on Stack, you'll get a chance to speak, but we still have a lot more to get to. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, this is a dialectic, dialectic materialism and user and user value and use value and exchange value. I I don't think it's I think there are people that understand it. I don't think it's all that difficult to understand. Um, as a matter of fact, I very recently read a book uh, it's called The Meaning of Marxism, and I find it explained in here very, uh, not only understandably, but in a very useful manner, and the book's quite cheap. It's like $14. And, um, and, you, only, and you can get it at the table over there. I think it's the last one they have, but you can get it more. You can also get it online at Pay Market Books. Um, but the only other thing I wanted to say is I am so proud of the people that put on this GA, and I'm proud of everybody that's here. This is amazing. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of other aspects of capital. Uh, I think people need to understand that capital, even Marx, yeah, there are several different varieties of capital, uh, not only the capital that's related to uh, uh, labor and uh, the point of production, contradiction, and so capital is also private property and land and rent. Uh, the fact that we're here has to do with that contradiction. What exploded this economy has to do with the fact that the mortgage market in land exceeds the stock market by a factor of about double. Uh, uh, if you look at the history of how this contradiction developed, the first privatization was the privatization of the commons, of the land. The way they created a proletariat was by alienating people from the ability 
to grow things for their own need on commonly held land. And they then exported that system through colonialism and conquest around the world. So people need to think about that contradiction when they think about what are the contradictions of capitalism. Uh, the other thing I think we need to think about is we live in an empire. And so there's a contradiction between appearance and reality. One of the things about dialectics and materialism is that it says everything has its own nature which expresses itself. Malcolm, in, in those contradictions, Malcolm X summed that up by saying that if a cat has kittens in the oven, it doesn't make them muffins. If you live in an empire, you're not a citizen. You're a subject of the empire. No matter what you think about your relationship is, the actual relationship is a relationship of colonialism and of conquest and everybody under that system of empire is the subject of the empire, whether they think they're a citizen or not. Um, my name is Mutti, I'm from the Freedom Socialist Party, and we are socialists, and we are feminists, and we're proud of it. There's, I think, I want to keep three quick comments. One of them is, inside that commodity, you have a, the, the basic essential contradiction. You have use value, and you have an exchange value, and the reason it's going to, do, capitalism is on a destruction course, is they can't live without the use value, which is what our labor is, and we can certainly live without them. Yeah. And without the exchange value, they swipe from us every day that we go to work. The only, I have a quick question for people, and we don't need to divide up. I, how many people here think the system we live under can actually be fixed? Raise your hand. Okay, all right. Fine. That's easy. <laughs> I think the debate can happen over what to turn it into and how to do that. This, this model tells us that without changing the fundamental, essential basis of the social pyramid, which is how things are made and who owns what, and gives it back to the workers who built it, nothing else will change. But inside that, there are, which is called the working class controls the means of production, in the total Marxist way to say it. But inside that, you have divisions that have to be overcome based on what was built into capitalism in order to have a fight with each other. Those are divisions based on sex, on race, on national origin and phony boundaries around the world. Those things have to be acknowledged by the movement and the people who we call those people in our movement be specially oppressed. And they have to be their their issues have to be first. Because if you answer those issues, everyone else's issues are addressed at the same time. It's not because somebody's better than the other. The third thing is, when we do unite our class and are able to transform production relations, we actually don't know how long it's going to take to get from there to a clear, stateless, communist world. And it is not hard. I mean, what we learn when we study dialectical materialism is that these things do jump. They sometimes go slow and they sometimes go fast, but we can't just say, we need stateless communism and so we're going to get it first. Yes, we can. You can say it. I tend to think it's unrealistic. I actually think it's idealistic as opposed to materialistic. We believe we should fight every place we have access to, whether it's in a school, or here, fight for our ideas, not fight for ideas. That's why we run for office as, a, as socialist feminists to register a protest vote against the whole goddamn system. Not because we think we're actually going to get elected, but then we have to dismantle the state. <laughs> Which would be the first thing we do. We would have to dismantle the whole U.S. government. It might engender more opposition when we have the forces to actually stop. Anyway, thank you. Up, but there's one other thing about the <laughs> versus ideas. The important thing about means of production, anyone can advocate whatever they want, but when you have a handful of less than one percent, we call I call it a rolling class, you can call it a one percent, with the idea, there's the internet. It's not a solution. If you look at Yahoo, you'll see the same crap about how wars are great 
How does system is Who great? goes to Yahoo? Anyone here been to Yahoo in the last and, week? And Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> and we should go to Occupy. Go to Occupy. Most of the people here may not be the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times, but the other people do. And therefore, to make your own, anyone can make their own little newspaper and do it. But what's important to do is to take the power out of their hands and be able to change the society. Oh. You can make your own little vegetable garden, but it's not going to get rid of the Monte or my former exploiting employer, Birds on. Shut them down. Although you'll have tastier and healthier food if you do your own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's the end for the analysis part, and now we're going to do um, sort of a, a real quick history of uh, Chile and how they've been affected by capitalism. Greetings, community. I'm going to, I wanted to give you, I'll try my best to make this brief, but it's a, it's a, def, it's a definite uh, story behind uh, Neil Wilbur's film as well as the uh, What's behind the, the project of neoliberalism in Latin America? Uh, basically, Chile was the uh, central part for this invention to take place uh, centuries ago. But at the same time, um, there was also um, there was already a policy or a system that was emerging within Latin America. But at the same, but at the same time, um, the Chicago boys, based from Chicago, decided to ran you know to hijack. Latin America, uh, the southern, southern Latin America, to give away uh, free, pop, uh, free uh, market capitalism. And um, I just go further by saying that uh, we all know that capitalism will never be a peaceful system. We, we know that for a fact um, in history. You know what I mean? Because the amount of heaviness of, of monopolies, um, military, and the um, and the police state. Capitalism is uh, pretty much a, a ticking time bomb among uh, among nations through this uh, globe. And um, this one fella, I'm not going to mention his full name, but his his fella happens to be named uh, Mr. Freeman. You probably know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but Mr. Yeah, that's right. But here it is. He actually wrote this book called Capitalism and Freedom back in 1962. He advocated for taxing. Big time. He did. He's a big time fan of taxes. Yeah, exactly. And um, but this book happens to be a, a rule book for uh, for global free market, um, you know, economic agendas, and it's pretty much a a, a manifesto for neoconservative uh, movements throughout the world. It actually was a manifesto to forge neoconservatism as as well as neoliberal, so it's, you know, contrary of the two. Um, but get this, like during the, the mid-50s, or to say the post-war period of the 1950s, um, there was this uh, policy that was already emerging, and it was uh, from uh, John Mayo Cain. If you're familiar with Cain's uh, economics, somehow this this was, um, uh, it, it was somewhat a Capitalism with a happy face, sort of uh, policy that Spain has uh, implemented in, uh, in Europe as well as in here in North America during the, um, the during the, the New Deal, you know, period. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is because this is also just a, a, a review of why and how come that we have Social Security, you know, workers uh, protection as well as uh, health care. It pretty much started from John Payne's uh, policy. Um, but to get back to uh, this person named Mr. Freeman, he wants to, um, he wants to have this, this all-out war against Social Security. He wants an all-out war against uh, free health care. And he wants to uh, also we regulate the accumulation of wealth so that way we'll have full, uh, full profit uh, or income for, for education. 
Sarah, et cetera, you know, he, uh, but if uh, Mr. Freeman decided, nah, nah, corporations should have uh, the will and say of how, of how we handle profit in this system. And uh, he called for privatization on education, health care, you name it. Everything must be privatized. And he also called out for the um, all-out um, corporate stock, as well as you know the monetary um, intimacy for for neoliberalism. You know what I mean? So Mr. Fred Freeman is a bad guy. You know we all know that for a fact. But um, to get to the to the point, he also invented the Ch Chicago School, and it's also a, a counter revolution. Um, you know, pathway to, uh, to interfere any country that w that wants to um, form a, a social welfare state. You know, Freeman was pretty much the uh, you know the instigator for for the cause to take place in, in various countries uh, such as Latin America. But to get back to Latin America during the 1950s, um, Chile, Argentina. Uh, the Southern Corea of Brazil, as well as Uruguay, has already invented uh, a policy that that was pretty much helped. Uh, was a very um, a helpful policy, and, and it was called the um, the developmentalism, which is which means that in, some, in countries such as Latin America, uh, it was reaching out or turning away from the from the poverty uh, level that they were at like centuries before 1950 and they able to uh, monitor, yeah, monetize their uh, their economy. But sadly, the, the Chicago boys came in and uh, took over not only the institutions, the economic institutions, but also, um, you know, the state, uh, such as military, as well as, you know, the infrastructure of, of the country. So sadly, in the 1970s, uh, the coup d'etat took place, you know, in Chile, uh, Santiago, Santiago, uh, the capital of, of Chile. And um, after that, they pretty much um, brought in neoliberalism as well as the, uh, the, the uh, destructiveness of free market capitalism. And uh, and decades later, Chile wound up falling into debt because of free market capitalism. Um, I would like to go further, but my time is up. Um, I highly recommend you to check out uh, a book from not only Klein, Shock Doctrine, and that will pretty much explain everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's, go, let's go for do a little bit of discussion now, because then people, you know, people are a little, you know, we don't want to keep talking at you. So let's just, let's just do a discussion about um, the alternative. Um, and we don't really, we don't want to, um, you know, give a presentation on what the different alternatives are and just tell you, like, this is what it is. Um, we want to make sure that um, we keep it open and that we also, like, just, that we tailor it to you and what questions you want to know about the different, you know, what, what are the alternatives. Uh, but to kind of give you just a framework, uh, Paul's well, going to read over the, kind of the basic definition of the different forms of that. Uh, yeah, do them all. All right, so these uh, definitions are suggestions. They're not, you know, complete definitions. They could be added to, they could be subtracted from. They're more putting out, being put out there to stimulate discussion. So, alternatives to capitalism. The first one we have is anarchy, which we conceive as to organize society via voluntary association without the use of. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. well. Okay. All right. To organize society via voluntary associations without the use of coercion, violence, or authority. In an anarchist society, everyone is free. No one is compelled to do anything they do not want to do. Rather, individuals work together to determine how their communities should be structured and organized. Socialism, an economic system characterized by public ownership and planning of all major industries, 
manufacturing, service and energy, banks and insurance companies, agribusiness, transportation, media and medical facilities. We define communism as a revolutionary movement to create a classless, moneyless, and stateless social order structured upon common ownership of the means of production, as well as a social, political, and economic ideology that aims at the establishment of this social order.